Hi, this is Len Edgerly. Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles podcast. Today is February 5th, and I am recording this in the bathroom of our rental house in Sanibel. That's because there's good acoustics here, and I'm two doors away from the living room where Darlene and Deborah are watching TV at full volume. So we got a good thing going here. This week's interview is with Patrick Woolahan. He is an executive at Amazon. He's responsible, well, as internal job description is worldwide series lead. And that means that he's in charge of improving the customer uh, ability to find books in a series. That's the simplest uh, way of looking at it. But if you think it's a simple job, you will hear in our conversation just how nuanced the series aspect of book reading can be. And falling in love with a series is one of the big pleasures in book reading, uh, falling into a whole new world. And uh, Patrick is right in the middle of it. Also this week, there was big news. Amazon announced record sales and earnings and broke the news that Jeff Bezos will retire as CEO this year in July. Uh, I'll have a lot more on that and more in this episode, which is episode 653. Let's get started. Amazon this week announced its fourth quarter results. Net sales were up 44% to $125.6 billion compared with a year ago. Net income more than doubled for the quarter to $7.2 billion compared with $3.3 billion in Q4 of 2019. But that wasn't the big news that came out of the release. Uh, it, there was just a simple sentence after the financials within the release itself. It said, Amazon is also announcing today that Jeff Bezos will transition to the role of executive chair in the third quarter of 2021. And Andy Jassy will become chief executive officer at that time. Well, boom, that was big news, and there was a lot of coverage of this, a lot of it pretty good, and I'm going to share some of it, especially from Stephen Levy, who has had a chance to interview Jeff Bezos over the years, and I thought had a thoughtful piece on it in his newsletter. Uh, the press release quotes a couple of lines from the letter that Jeff wrote to employees, and it, it's, a, it's a concise letter. It's, it's in the spirit of the six-page memos. I'm sure Jeff thought about this one a lot, and I'm sure he wrote it himself. He probably, I'm sure he had some feedback from others that he trusts and, and gets, but you can hear his voice in this, and I'd like to read it to you because I think it's a, a summary statement of what he has accomplished in the past 27 years and what he sees ahead for the company and himself. Self. Fellow Amazonians, I'm excited to announce that this Q3 I'll transition to executive chair of the Amazon board and Andy Jassy will become CEO. In the exec chair role, I, ten I intend to focus my energies and attention on new products and early initiatives. Andy is well known inside the company and has been at Amazon almost as long as I have. He will be an outstanding leader and he has my full confidence. This journey began some 27 years ago. Amazon was only an idea and, I had no and it had no name. The question I was asked most frequently at that time was, what's the internet? Blessedly, I haven't had to explain that in a long while. Today, we employ 1.3 million talented, dedicated people, serve hundreds of millions of customers and businesses, and are widely recognized as one of the most successful companies in the world. How did that happen? Invention. Invention is the root of our success. We've done crazy things together and then made them normal. We pioneered customer reviews, one-click, personalized recommendations, Prime's insanely fast shipping, Just Walk Out Shopping, the Climate Pledge, Kindle, Alexa, Marketplace, Infrastructure, Cloud Computing, Career Choice, and much more. If you get it right, a few years after a surprising invention, the new thing has become normal. People yawn. And that yawn is the greatest compliment an inventor can receive. I don't know of another company with an invention track record as good as Amazon's, and I believe we are at our most inventive right now. I hope you are as proud of our inventiveness as I am. I think you should be. 
As Amazon became large, we decided to use our scale and scope to lead on important social issues. Two high-impact examples, our $15 minimum wage and the Climate Pledge. In both cases, we staked out leadership positions and then asked others to come along with us. In both cases, it's working. Other large companies are coming our way. I hope you're proud of that as well. I find my work meaningful and fun. I get to work with the smartest, most talented, most ingenious teammates. When times have been good, you've been humble. When times have been tough, you've been strong and supportive, and we've made each other laugh. It is a joy to work on this team. As much as I still t tap dance into the office, I'm excited about this transition. Millions of customers depend on us for our services, and more than a million employees depend on us for their livelihoods. Being the CEO of Amazon is a deep responsibility, and it's consuming. When you have a responsibility like that, it's hard to put attention on anything else. As exec chair, I will stay engaged in important Amazon initiatives, but also have the time and energy I need to focus on the Day One Fund, the Bezos Earth Fund, Blue Origin, the Washington Post, and my other passions. I've never had more energy, and this isn't about retiring. I'm super passionate about the impact I think these organizations can have. Amazon couldn't be better positioned for the future. We are firing on all cylinders, just as the world needs us to be. We have things in the pipeline that will continue to astonish. We serve individuals and enterprises, and we've pioneered two complete industries and a whole new class of devices. We are leaders in areas as varied as machine learning and logistics, and if an Amazonian's idea requires yet another new institutional skill, we're flexible enough and patient enough to learn it. Keep inventing, and don't despair when at first the idea looks crazy. Remember to wonder. Let curiosity be your compass. It remains day one. Jeff. Uh, I, I think that's kind of a historic document and uh, well sums up this pivot point. Uh, Stephen Levy, as I said, wrote about this news in his weekly plain text newsletter. It's a free newsletter you can get. Uh, it's from Wired. It comes out every Friday. Uh, he recalls a conversation that he had with Jeff in July of 2018 in West Texas. That he was there to visit the Blue Origin launch facility. Uh, and he, this is a quote from the newsletter. Levy writes, Bezos told me that the tremendous personal resources he had amassed liberated him. I won't spend any time in my life working on anything I don't think is important, he told me. I'm just not going to. I don't need to. Like watching sitcoms, I wondered. This is Levy's question to him. And Bezos replies, no, I'll do hobbies. I'll see movies. I'm talking about work. I'm not going to work on something that I don't think is improving civilization. I think the Washington Post does that. I think Amazon does that. And I think Blue Origin does that. And I'm not going to put productive energy into anything that doesn't improve civilization. Why would I? What would I be trying to do? <laughs> uh... Levy uh, is, I, I think, takes these high-minded sentiments seriously, as anybody would who's followed Jeff Bezos over the years. But he also wryly adds that the CEO job that Jeff is giving up this year in July uh, will probably include, quote, depositions, congressional testimony, and lobbying to prove that Amazon is not an anti-competitive predator. Uh, Levy noted, and I, I, I guess I hadn't been aware of this, that in 2018, Jeff had already delegated day-to-day -day operations to two junior CEOs, one for retail, one for web services. The retail guy, Jeff Wilkie, who I thought was the most likely successor to Jeff, uh, instead, he's retiring from Amazon this quarter. That left Andy Jassy, who now will be CEO of all of Amazon later this year. Uh, Levy has spent quality time with the founders of all of the big tech companies, and he wrote in today's newsletter, while it's sometimes good sport for these founders to crush competitors, the real excitement comes from building things, tapping once again into the exhilaration that came when their original ideas took flight. But it gets harder to do that when you are in charge of, of one of the pillars of the economy. Uh, that day in West Texas, Jeff took Levy a few miles north of the launch pad to see the mountain that Jeff owns, which is the site of a clock designed to last 10,000 years. It, the purpose of this remarkable project is to direct 
human, humans' thoughts to the long term. But Levy says it will also, quote, force visitors to confront their own fragile claim to time. And uh, Bezos is now going to have more time to uh, speed up the clock on his passion project. Blue Origin really is the top one. And the other ones that he mentioned in the letter to employees, uh, specifically the Washington Post. Naturally, there is now a lot of uh, questioning about who is Andy Jassy. Uh, I, uh, there's an article Jason Del Rey wrote in uh, Recode, a handy summary, said that Jassy joined Amazon in 1997, three years after its founding. And for the last 15 years, he has run Amazon Web Services, AWS, which controls about one third of the cloud computing industry. Uh, Jassy also served as Jeff's first technical advisor. That position is now known as uh, Jeff's shadow, and the person spends one to two years accompanying him to every meeting, serving as a sounding board. And a key part of that shadow job is to learn how Jeff thinks and makes decisions. Uh, one former executive said uh, uh, Jeff is under, just as Bezos is underrated in how good a teacher he is. You know, everybody knows he's brilliant. He's an inventor, but he, apparently he's also a, a, takes seriously the job of teaching what he knows. And that is also said to be true of Andy. Another said that Andy is right a lot. He pays attention to detail. He reads every AWS press release before publication. Uh, and the alignment, I think, is around the central point of how Jeff sees Amazon, which is it's an invention company. And Jassy played a crucial role in inventing AWS, which now is uh, really the it's the most profitable part of the company and really an, an amazing accomplishment that Amazon has uh, created out of basically out of nothing. Uh, Fast Company had a profile of Jesse by Harry McCracken, and he, he noted that, uh, yes, he's created AWS, he's an inventor, but he also knows how to sell stuff. He was product manager for music back in 2001, and now he's going to be in charge of uh, what Amazon sells to everybody. Uh, big news, and I it, it makes sense to me how Bezos has managed this transition. And it's really one of the biggest transitions that a CEO has to pull off. Uh, I know from my own father's experience, he had a CEO position in Boston. And the thought that he put into hiring, promoting, and grooming the person that succeeded him was, uh, you know, we saw it in the family we, in, in talking to him. It was a key job. And, and I, so I know that uh, Bezos put that kind of effort into this transition. And so far, it seems to be relatively seamless and something which people that understand how the company operates, how Bezos operates, and are familiar with Jassy's work are pretty confident in Amazon's future. I don't think it's so much saying, oh, is he going to do what Tim Cook did at Apple and maintain uh, Steve Jobs's trajectory? Uh, Jassy, I think, is a little bit more... He's not a clone of Bezos, but he's uh, he's as close to uh, embodying the vision of the company that that Bezos probably could have found. And and it's a, it's been a twenty seven year project, starting from when he was his shadow back then, and uh, everything else. So uh, for someone who thinks about the long term, as Bezos does. This isn't that surprising a kind of a transition. It seems very methodical, well thought out. And my opinion, I think it'll probably be successful. Time now for the interview. Patrick Willihan earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering in 2007 from the University of Notre Dame and then worked in Chicago for five years at Accenture, the strategy and consulting firm. After returning to Notre Dame for his MBA in finance, he took a job at Amazon in Seattle, where I reached him at his home by Skype on Groundhog Day. Uh, by the way, I always uh, receive excellent help from Amazon's media relations team in setting up interviews, but I'd like to mention particularly the terrific job that PR manager Jessica Cromie did over the past month in connecting me with Patrick for this week's show. I was very grateful for that. 
I began by asking Patrick how he decided to leave the Midwest where he grew up and went to school and head for Seattle and a new career at Amazon. At that time, uh, I was working at Accenture and, and a lot of what I was doing was really focused on big system integration. So just helping helping companies kind of install the things that, that help them manage their inventory and, and sales, et cetera. Um, so lots of, lots of really, really big um, projects that were fairly plug and play. And, and kind of, I realized that wasn't what necessarily what I wanted to do for the next, um, you know, 20, 40 years. And it was at the, one of those points where you were like, I can either go really, really deep on this and, uh, or I can could kind of change things up. And so I decided to, to change things up um, and, and go and get my MBA. And then uh, kind of between years one and two, uh, kind of the, the expectation is that everybody gets an internship. And uh, one, of, one of the companies I was interested in was Amazon. Their philosophy and reputation as a company had really impressed me. Um, but at the same time, I hadn't spent a lot of time out on the West Coast. I always joke that I was born in Michigan, schooled in Indiana, went to work in Illinois, uh, would probably end up retiring in Wisconsin and dying in Minnesota. But <laughs> at, the, at the time, I... Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a good opportunity for a summer, kind of spend some time somewhere different, uh, get to see a part of the country, um, and kind of worst case scenario, I got a ton of great experience at a, at a kind of uh, really well-known company and, and kind of get to know the Pacific Northwest and then figure things out in year two. Um, kind of then, uh, you know, happy happy to report that I that the summer went uh, really well and, and kind of enjoyed my time there, both at Amazon as well as as. Um, in Seattle, you completed your first year MBA at Notre Dame, and uh, so that summer between the years, did, did they throw you into pretty interesting projects, or how did, how did they make use of you in that short of time? So the standard uh, kind of intern process generally um, is organized around, and it depends on on um, kind of person by person, but it's like a ten, 10 to twelve week internship where you're kind of focused on one kind of fairly ambiguous customer problem end to end. And that's something that, um, you know, that, that Amazon's looking to get, uh, you know, make, make movement on quickly. Um, but it's also well scoped that you can really do, do some damage in terms of, uh, figure things out in terms of how this might work or, or how do we solve this, uh, or improve the experience for customers in a relatively short amount of time. Hmm. So you go and hit the ground running, kind of get to know all the the kind of ins and outs of the, the area of the business that you're working on, and then you kind of put together uh, what we like to uh, we refer to them as six pa- six pages at Amazon, but just a really comprehensive document, kind of how you thought through the process and what ultimately your recommendation would be, and then then kind of that's final paper isn't the, isn't the right term, but it's kind of a a way to to kind of summarize your your internship and and, and that uh, is kind of one of the, the big pieces that, that goes into whether you get a full-time offer or not. Well, which is more intense and challenging, a, a 10-week internship at Amazon or the second year of your MBA at Notre Dame? I know my second year at Harvard Business School was uh, pretty darn intense, and the, the pace that an MBA program puts you through is, is not, uh, let's say, calm. But what was it like to sort of go – uh, first year MBA internship at Amazon, then back to the MBA, where the, the two very different worlds. I think they were intense in, in very different ways. Amazon was just really like one one really deep dive um, that you spend a lot of time thinking about, and kind of you can uh, you know how do you get done things done quickly? How do you think strategically while also executing at the same time? So there's a big big portion of that. Admittedly, the second the second year of the of MBA was also really really fun and challenging, and, and got some great opportunities to go out and, and uh, kind of hang out with some some VCs and yeah. um, learn more on the kind of job skills side but at the same time i think uh having that that uh conviction that i was going going to end up back at amazon was also helpful in terms of didn't have to do as many interviews and and the like so i was really able to focus on kind of some of the product management and some of the things that i really liked uh about my time at at amazon and how do i double down on that and and kind of get get better at that um which made kind of the second year both um really focused but also really fun when you finished the internship and went into your second year did you have a commitment from amazon that they would offer you a position or just a strong indication that it had gone well what what was your certain that you really were headed there to work after graduating. I think at the time I, I thought things had gone well, but uh, I think Amazon Amazon's really great about getting back to people really quickly to make sure um, you know, we think we think about our uh, kind of interview ease as as. Um, 
customers the same way that we think about our, our readers as customers. Huh. And so whether it was like a, year, a week or two kind of inter, into the second term, like I knew pretty pretty early on that, that um, kind of I'd, I'd have a full-time offer. Oh, that's great. And then you could kind of design your second year to take full advantage of what you could pick up in Notre Dame in preparation for that. Yeah. So I was able to take some like user-centered design classes and then just really get into some of the um, – kind of focus, focus classwork that, that uh, would be more extensible. Yeah. Well, now, your first day of work at Amazon looks like it was May of 2013. Do you remember which day in May that was that you walked into day one or wherever for the first time? My first first day back at Amazon, um, post-internship, um, again, I think it was a lot of the same stuff in terms of here's your, here's your computer, here's your take a yeah. photo, uh, a backpack, here's your desk type of thing. But, I, I, I mean, it, it both felt kind of new as well as um, familiar. So I, I kind of was, I returned, I did my internship in the um, book space or the Kindle space and, and returned to a, a slightly different Kindle team. So hmm. kind of thinking thinking about the same general customers, same um, general uh, kind of problems, but um, with with some new team members. So it was, and that it was also not just a, hey, you're going to sprint for, for 12, 12 weeks and, and kind of put things together, but uh, this is kind of a long term piece, so a lot bigger, bigger scope and more things to think about. But really helped to have some of that that familiarity from the internship. Hmm. Well, and I recall, you know, my my time in the MBA was a long forty years ago or so, and the the difference between an, an academic setting and a work setting, uh, it's hard for even the top business schools to to keep relevant with what's actually happening in the corporate world. But did you, in looking back on your Notre Dame MBA, did you feel like a lot of the things you learned and experienced there were very applicable to Amazon, even as it's operating kind of at a different pace and a different philosophy, the customer centric? Uh, how, how, how well did the MBA time actually serve you in, in entering Amazon at full speed? I don't use too much of like my corporate mergers and acquisitions class in my day to day, but but there is certainly like a lot, a lot, especially in the second year where I was able to kind of focus on on some more of the stuff that I really found that I liked and 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 wanted to kind of shape my career towards. So things like that that um, kind of user centered design and stuff where we're actually solving uh, problems or taking on projects for the university itself and trying to to oh. kind of what would but would a product be there or how do we solve this problem? Like some of that is more practical hands-on experience. And then um, again, some of the uh, opportunities that I was afforded to go out and, and um, you know, shadow people that were working in, in, in the tech industry and kind of learning about how they think about problems and how they think about uh, acquiring customers and virtual product cycles. Like uh, it was a good blend of both class classroom learning as well as some good hands-on opportunity that, that I do think it, you know, ex- extended very well to, to time at Amazon. And then obviously the, the internship, um, you know, is, is super clarifying in terms of what uh, kind of real life at Amazon is like. Yeah, that sounds like a good mix. I know you oversaw the, the series updates, which we're going to talk about for the Kindle. Uh, can you give me a little more of a view? Uh, are, are you responsible for products other than Kindle? My internal title is Worldwide Series Lead. Um, and so kind of what I own is is everything series uh, for both Kindle and uh, uh books or, or print books. Um, so kind of not just within the uh, app and device uh, side of the world, but also um, from a back-end data perspective from the, the store side. Any Anything that has to do with series, kind of uh, I lead the team of, of product managers, developers, designers, data specialists that are really like wherever series improvements need to happen. And my, it's my team's responsibility to kind of Figure, figure out what, how we can help customers and, and um, what needs to come together to make that happen. That's an interesting specialty. Uh, have you always been a reader of series books, or what, what was the thing which uh, established you as the go-to series guy at Amazon for books? Obviously, I've been in, in books for almost uh, seven years now, um, or books are Kindle in a variety of roles. Um, and so I think I've, I've uh, like one, and, and I've been, largely successful in uh, some innovations in the author space. And so um, between kind of some of my background with, and, and you know, if, if listeners could, could see my uh, background right now, I've got a, a 
huge wall of, of book, most of books, most of which are in series. I do a lot of series reading. Um, and so I knew the, knew the, the customer needs and, and challenges really well. Um, and I also kind of have a lot of experience working with our, uh, you know, enhancing our author, um, uh, uh, capabilities. So series was kind of a new challenge that, that, um, I was asked to, to lead and, and happy to kind of bring, bring my specialties and my experience, uh, to, to do some awesome things for customers. Well, let's, let's tell the story of the series capability in the latest update for Kindle 5.13.4. When you say that, I'm assuming you're talking about the, the feature that we like to call library series grouping. Um, I'll circle back to that in a second, but one of the things I want to call out is that, that this is just the latest um, series enhancement that, that we've launched. Um, my team has really been working um, hard over the past year and a half to kind of introduce a number of series features. Some are, some are more subtle than others. Um, things like enhanced search results that allow you or make it easier for you to discover which books go in which order, uh, ability for our KDP authors to directly manage their series and make sure that everything is represented uh, correctly on site and, and provide kind of series level descriptions. We've now got series pages available on every single surface. So regardless of where you're reading or what you're connected to, you can get in and, and kind of figure out what book comes next. Um, and uh, the library series grouping specifically, uh, which I know is one of the, the more, uh, uh, or which has a lot of our customers excited, is is uh, kind of the latest latest update um, that's really meant to bring some of those series enhancements to reader libraries themselves. And so uh, it, it it is available across the the three e readers with the with the most recent release, as well as something that we've pushed out on uh, our, our free apps on iOS and Android, as well as Fire uh, Fire tablets. Uh, how does it work? Uh, what, maybe walk us through. Uh, now my wife is uh, uh, she's she's the series reader of the family, and she likes. Uh, mysteries mainly and i have spent 12 years learning really cool things that the kindle can do and every time i go to my wife and i say did you know that if you can highlight stuff you can get a list of your highlights printed out to you and and she always listens somewhat politely uh and then just says i just want to read the books i don't want all these fancy things that you (laughs) that you can do but when i told her that there was a way to organize series she, she perked up, and it looked like it was the first time she was actually maybe going to take the trouble to ask me how this new thing that Kindle can do works. Uh, so if you picture a uh, someone who doesn't know all the great stuff that Kindle can do but loves a series, what would be the pitch to her that this is something that really is going to kind of uh, improve her, her reading experience on the Kindle? Sure. Uh, the library series grouping at, at a high level, it, it really auto organizes um, content in your library based on the, the series that the books are attached to. And um, so like in terms of the, the experience itself, uh, rather than seeing kind of all of the books uh, kind of grouped, whether it's by recency or by title or by author, however you've chosen to sort your libraries, library, they now sit kind of in a stack and there's a visual indicator that says, you know, there's more books stacked here. We say like this stack contains uh, seven items for example and then when you click on it um, it takes you to a sub page that specifically um, shows you each of the uh, books in in the prescribed order you still have the ability to sort like what if you want to see by publication date or by most recently uh, read book you can you can do that but you know if you want to see it in the series order it shows you what book one is book two is book three is um, which was was one of the, the things that we heard uh, a lot from our customers in terms of just making make it uh, easy for me to know which book I should read next we I, I absolutely hate it when I hear customers I'm sure your wife's the same way that says like, oh, I got 100 pages into what I thought was book two, only to find it was book three. And I, I spoiled myself. Or I ruined, ruined the story. And, and that's something that, that we wanted to avoid. And then the other aspect is, is kind of we have a, almost a series summary, which kind of lets the customer know uh, or the reader know how many books they have in their library in the series as well as how many books there are so if, it, if you are one of those customers that wants help like knowing when there's more books to uh, read um, particularly in the series you're, you're most excited about it, it kind of gives you a one 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 glance and then one tap way to see hey there's more to read and and uh, it's easy to go and, and figure out what you should read next now i've got an interview i think coming up uh, next month with cj box because he's got a new book out in his uh, series go pick it yep She's she's read, I think, a lot of the uh, Pickett series. If she just enters 
CJ Box on her Kindle search page at kind of the home page level, will she see this stacked icon that says here are all the CJ Box uh, series titles you have, and or does she have to do anything fancier than that to actually see that new series icon? No, she should be able to search, uh, whether it's by author or by the series name, um, to, to bring up that kind of series subview. And so when you search for a name, and one of the things that we, we uh, you know, as we think about the customer experience, uh, like if I, uh, you know, maybe maybe your wife's got a perfect memory, but if I happen to say, like, what's the 16th book in the, the Joe Pickett series, most most readers aren't going to be able to tell you that. And, and so that you might not know exactly what the name of the book is you're reading, but you remember the character, you remember the series, you remember the author. And so when to make sure that if a customer does come in and, and is looking through or looking for books with the content that that's kind of readily available um, in their mind that that when they search for that they can get to the series level so you don't have to know exactly what book you're looking for you can have just the series name or the author and will allow you to, to kind of jump right into that series view so if you are like you know I, I happen to buy you know four uh, Joe Pickett books when they're on sale I don't remember which one I should read next uh, or which one I should read first, search for Joe Pickett, you can get to the sub view and then be like, okay, book five has a, a red icon on it, book six doesn't, so I'll start off on, on book six. Or maybe it happens that you bought books seven through 11 and, and uh, you know you just realized that you've never read book six, and, and so there's a good kind of reminder to, to stop and, and go, go find that book. And it probably makes it pretty easy once you see one that you haven't read yet to just tap and buy it uh, kind of one click. Basically, if you want to see all books in the series, it's available one click away, and, and uh, um, that page also supports kind of, uh, again, that ownership of, of you know, have you, uh, do you have this book in your library or not? And then you can, uh, if it is one that you uh, haven't bought, you can, you can buy it. Or if it's one that if you have access to in your Kindle Unlimited subscription, you can borrow it uh, right from there as well. Hmm. Well, now you mentioned that you, it, it's disappointing to hear a customer say, oh, I started reading this uh, book in the series. It was out of order. It was sort of a spoiler effect. Were there other comments uh, that you heard from customers, sort of pain points about the series function that led to your most recent improvement, improvement of it? Or what, what, what were the customers telling you that uh, guided you to, to work on this topic? I mean, at a high level, thinking across all, all series, like we know customers love series um, and, and, you know, falling in love with a series is one of the most uh, kind of delightful experiences as a reader, like just finding a deep world that, that, you know, you know, you reach the end of one book that you really enjoyed and, and you've got, you know, 10, if not 20 more, more books to come, more books to go. And, and kind of, that's a really inspiring moment for customers. And so we hear from them in terms of like, this is really what, where I like, like, I like to fall in love with the series. I like to keep reading it. And, um, you know, it shouldn't be as hard as it was in order, uh, in terms of going out and, um, kind of knowing that there's more books to read or figuring out which one to read. Like we, you know, hear customers talk about, you know, I, reading on my e-reader device, finish the book, and then I have to set down my device or pick up my phone or pick up my pick up my laptop and, you know, look at Wikipedia or look at the author website. And, and, and it becomes almost a scavenger hunt sometimes um, for some of these complex series to figure out what um, book comes next. And we wanted to just make it, you know, as easy as possible to, to uh, custom, for customers to really have an immersive reading experience and just kind of have that information readily available where, wherever they're reading rather than needing to, to disrupt what, what they're doing and, and try to go find it. Now, some of the successful KDP authors I've talked to, Jerry Riddle comes to mind and others, it, it seems like the series driver is particularly important for a lot of uh, KDP authors. And... It, am I right that if you are writing for KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing, and you've got a series, does the author have to do anything new to take advantage of this functionality, or does it just sort of magically apply to the books in, in the series that they've got out there already? I hesitate to use the word word magically. A lot of a lot of hard work goes in under the hood, both on the part of authors as well as 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 uh, some of some of our team members to make sure that everything uh, works works uh, kind of autom automatically for customers. But but that really is the intent to make sure that it's simple. In terms of uh, KDP authors, one of the other launches that I mentioned, uh, our KDP uh, series self service, allows authors to uh, kind of when they're in the process of publishing a new book, kind of position it right. Uh, 
or, or in conjunction with the other books in the series. So from the second that that is available on site, it's kind of attached in the right place. Customers can find it, mm. um, and kind of all of the the um, elements of the the series customer uh, experience, whether it's in search results on the detail pages in the reader, like all of those things will start working. Um, automatically to, to help uh, help readers discover the next uh, or that there's more content to be read. That's got to help sales of, of a KDP author to, because it's, it really goes to discoverability and it's targeting people that already love your stuff so that you're, if you're making it easier for them to uh, find the parts of your series that they maybe don't know about yet, uh, I would think those KDP authors would would think this is catnip. Yeah, we, we definitely hope so. And I mean, ultimately, like we know that our, our that readers love to re- keep reading books in the series that they, they really enjoy. You know, you don't have to, to try something new or you don't have to um, kind of spe- go out of your way to kind of try something that you might not like. And, uh, and authors are, you know, anytime you're bringing uh, people back to, to buy another one of your book, you're happy. So it's a real, real positive win-win in terms of uh, the, both the reader, reader and the author side. Um, yeah. And, and we're, we're great to, to help uh, connect those two. Now, uh, uh, Jessica kind of primed me with the idea that uh, the order of a series might not necessarily just be one, two, three chronologically when they were published. Are there other ways that it's helpful to a customer to, to order a series? Yeah, one of the, the things that's really surprised us about series in general is just how much complexity there really is. Um, and that, that there's there's both a kind of the most successful stories attract more stories or, or like rich worlds like George R. Martin's kind of a Song of Ice and Fire series. Like there's just so much like depth that that it, it almost you know attracts attracts further further or warrants further exploration. And so a lot of these series kind of grow organically and change in a lot of interesting ways. And you can have series and then you know, one series followed by a sub series that can be read independently. But if you read them back to back, you kind of get a, a, a deeper experience. Um, and so there's a lot a lot of kind of complexity in that world at the same time there's also places where kind of the publication order of the books and and the kind of chronological order or if you were a character living through the, the moments like would differ a couple of, of uh, specific examples would be uh, Stephen King's Dark Tower series where he came back after finishing book seven and, and wrote a book 4.5 that took place between book four and book five but book four is still book four book five is still book five and um, or the Chronicles of Narnia where when I was a kid um, and I read it. I think *The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*, which was published first, uh, was considered to be book one. Now I think it's actually considered to be book three. Hmm. And so even even by a um, you know the, the reasonable reasonable readers can kind of kind of reasonably disagree about what the right order is. Um, and so a lot of the things that we've you know been thinking about is how do we solve some of these more complex use cases? How do we best represent it uh, to customers and make it just easy to know again what what to read next and abstract some of that complexity while still respecting the fact that these are kind of series that customers enjoy reading uh, together and, and helping them discover all of the kind of corner cases um, hmm. uh, around around some of the nuances. Did anything surprise you as you were working your way through uh, these complexities uh, in, in series in the last year? What, what was your biggest aha moment of seeing something you just hadn't understood before? I thought I knew the series space well, kind of coming into it based on my experience as a reader. And particularly as you crack open kind of uh, what a lot of our, our Kindle Direct publishing authors are doing, like KDP and and has unlocked a wave of creativity in terms of like what can be published. You don't have to worry about inventory and print runs and a lot of these pieces that might say like, yeah, I don't know if, I don't know if we can actually produce that. And so as a result, you get all these very interesting narrative structures when it comes to, you know, prequels and short stories and side novels and, you know, romance books, uh, one, one series, like you can actually read the same series, but if you want to read the kind of R rated version, you can follow one track. If you want to read the more PG or PG, Thirteen, you get another track, um, or, or uh, there's one particular series that actually it's a set of two trilogies. Uh, it's by I think Will White, and and one follows the antagonist, um, or one follows the protagonist through the trilogy. The other one kind of tells the story from the antagonist's point of view, and so like all of these, like just the sheer creativity and, and new narrative structures. Um, 
you know, I open my eyes to like, oh man, now we have to go back and think about how do we, how do we handle this particular use case or simplify this for customers. Huh. Um, and it was something that was kind of always challenging. There's always, it, it's also some, one of the things that's made it kind of fun and exciting is there's always some, a new puzzle to, to kind of wrap our heads around and, and, and make sure that we've got it fixed the right way. Is there a series that you're currently reading or one that was uh, an early passion of yours that, that informed the work you're doing? What, what's, what's your top tip and of a good series to read, maybe in the mystery genre, so I can pass it along to my wife. A mystery genre, that, that one's tricky. I can definitely follow up with, with some of our, our best. I, I personally am more of a science fiction fantasy fan. When it comes to a series, like it's really interesting because listening to customers kind of, some people prefer reading series in different ways. Some customers or some readers like will only touch a series once it's 100% finished. They, mm. they like the binge reading. They like, you know, I'm going to crank out 20 books back to back to back to back. Um, some people are willing to kind of, I'm going to start with the, the first book in the trilogy and, and, and kind of let that, uh, you know, even if it's a year or two between, between books, I'm going to follow it that way. I think in terms of some of the most um, kind of, or the active series that that are still coming out at a good clip, on the on the fantasy side, uh, Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive. I think the fourth book just came out in November. Um, is, is one of the the uh, is probably at the the peak of the fantasy genre right now. And he's also published a couple of interstitial novels or novellas uh, through our KDP service. So there's there's like a a, a really uh, deep world there. Each book's about a thousand pages. Wow. Um, and and then on the um, science fiction side, I'm I'm looking forward to book nine in the Expanse series, which is I think by J James S. A. Corey, if I've got that right, um, and, and that's uh, I think really knocking it out of the park um, from a science fiction standpoint, almost with the same kind of level of, of depth of world building as as uh, George R. Martin's The Song of Ice and Fire. If you're more uh, kind of looking for something that's finished but aren't scared of, of something that's that's long, I'd point you towards uh, Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson again. Yeah, I've, I'm reading that one, and it's, isn't that just about to come out as a, an Amazon TV series, the the Wheel of Time? It is, and it's one I'm I'm super excited. I, I wish that we got, got to see uh, advanced copies. Of that. I'm not sure exactly when, when it's coming out, but but I am looking forward to that. That was one of my uh, kind of favorite favorite series growing up. But if you're looking for something a little bit shorter and a little bit different uh, and, and probably underread, which is probably none of the other recommendations are, are uh, super new to, to readers, I'd point to Ian Tregellis's, uh The Milkweed Triptych, which is a really, really interesting series. Um, it's just, just three books, and, and the, the premise is it's World War II, and the Germans kind of develop superheroes, or super, I mean, not superheroes, but super-powered individuals, you know, people that can punch through tanks and, and turn <laughs> light, light themselves on fire, etc. In order to, to combat that, the, uh, the British round up all the warlocks that have been kind of uh, bumming around England since uh, uh, Merlin's days. And so it turns into this really weird um, kind of uh, alternate history where there's, there's these superpowered kind of entities uh, kind of fighting a proxy war. I always think of it as like a perfect movie adaptation because it's got all the billion dollar blockbuster action sequences that you'd see in a Marvel movie as well as some of the, the deep kind of character introspection and some there's some really interesting morality uh, decisions um, that, that would you know earn, earn somebody like a best best actor nom. Um, Sounds good. And at the same time, it's a it's a triptych, not a trilogy. So uh, the the third book actually reflects on the first on a, in a really interesting way that kind of changes like you have to almost go back and read the first book and and, and how you think about it again so that's that's a one that um, kind of has been long long a favorite of mine and, and I don't think it's gotten the attention it deserves uh, well let's go back uh, in uh, November uh, November twenty third twenty eighteen. Uh, uh, there's a f nice photo of Jeff Bezos on stage with you, and you earned something called the Just Do It Award, which recognizes Amazonians who go above and beyond with new ideas to improve the customer's experience. And this was for a suite of Follow the Author features to help readers stay connected with their authors. Uh, a little background on that is 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 the Just Do It Award go to one person per year, or is it something that Jeff uh, uses to highlight uh, breakthroughs in a more general way. What, what what's that award? Uh, where does it stand in, in the Amazon uh, firmament of good things that could happen to you? Honestly, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think it's I think it's given quarterly. It tends to like the award tends to go out uh, during our, our quarterly all hands meeting. I, but I, I'm not 
100 percent sure but it's it's kind of a big deal it looks like i think so um i think like it's it's not uh something that's given out um with with a high degree of, of frequency and i was pretty pretty honored to receive it so i was i was excited to get that call what what were the things that you invented to, uh, to help readers stay connected to their favorite authors that was involved in in that recognition uh, I mean, part of part of the Just Do It Award is is the uh, both the idea as well as just the kind of willingness to go and execute. Uh -huh. And so, author follow at its core is is a relatively simple feature. It's it's really a kind of in a nutshell. When an author releases a new book, how do we ensure that that customers the customers who want to know about it do? If you look across a lot of the uh, kind of tech landscape, like there's a lot of like customers almost have the expectation that. They're going to have some measure of control about what they get notified about or what, um, like, they could customize their own experience. And for authors, um, you know, that, that, you know, people can have relationships with authors that span years or, or decades in some cases of, of, of reading books. But um, that doesn't always kind of sync with uh, the general re release cycle. Like George R. R. Martin, um, I'm, everybody's eagerly anticipating the we winds of winter, but, but the last book came out in 2012. So how do we make sure that, that a customer who, uh, you know, bought or read a book nine, nine years ago, you know, we, we let them know when, when a new book comes out. And so author follow, uh, kind of represented a very simple way to just allow authors or allow uh, readers to tell us which authors they wanted to, to make sure that we, uh, connected with them about. And, and it was up to us to, uh, kind of, uh, follow through and make sure that they were, they were, um, they, they knew about books that they were excited to read. Uh, one of the big things that, that went into the program was not just making sure that, that we did that for J.K. Rowling or George R. R. Martin, which, you know, honestly, it's probably harder to not know when those, <laughs> those authors like those um, release a new book, but make sure that it works for the people that are still um, kind of growing, growing the readership. So there's hundreds, if not, um, or hundreds if not millions of uh, hundreds of thousands if not millions of authors who kind of are, are trying to to grow their, their following um, or, or grow their reader base and we want to help them carry their readership from book to book rather than um, kind of help, like spend more less time writing and more time marketing we'd rather rather uh, they get to do what they really enjoy um, and kind of just continue to, to uh, kind of write 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 their books um, so that was a, a, a uh, kind of just general program that, that I started up and, and was able to connect the dots across a number of, of teams um, and get features launched with a, a relatively small, uh, small small team and, and I think the Just Do It Award was was a recognition of it was a relatively simple concept that was uh, well well executed um, and you know the program has has continued to grow and grow and I think that that we're you know continuously excited and proud that that we connect uh, readers with, with their favorite authors on a continuous basis. I, I think I've done that. Uh, I've, I've clicked somewhere, uh, had an opportunity to say, follow this author. But where, if you wanted to alert somebody to how to do that that didn't know, do you go to your Amazon.com page and log in and go somewhere? What's, what's the easiest way to uh, let your team know that uh, we want to hear news of a certain author? So one of our uh, general kind of philosophies or, or approaches was really like, let's make sure those buttons are available uh, when and where uh, readers are going to be kind of most interested in that. Um, so one of the one of the aspects is if you are re reading specifically on Kindle at the at the um, kind of after you finish the book, you get a page that says like, you know, how to, do you want to rate this book? Um, here, you know, next book in the series, some other recommendations, and and there, there's a follow the author section. So if you said like, oh, that was a really good book, like I'd like to know the next time that this person comes out with something, you have the ability to click it right, uh, like uh, click it right there. Um, there's also if you want to like, if you're searching an author name or you go to, like click on an author link on, anywhere on Amazon, it will take you to an author page, which is kind of the, the author home. And, and so there's follow buttons there. You can also see them on, on our product detail pages. So hmm. the follow buttons are, are generally live um, anywhere an, an author's name does. It should be fairly e easy to find. Most likely happen upon them on the, the kind of end, end experience uh, as you finish a book. Yeah, that seems like the perfect place. When you settle into a good series, are you generally reading on one of the Kindles, if so, which one? Or what's what's your uh, arsenal of technology for for settling in and for some good immersion reading uh, on, on your your Kindle uh, titles? Yeah, I mean, I, 
my my definition of immersion reading probably has changed. I've got a three year old, so immersion is is pretty much anywhere I can That's steal like ten minutes minute to myself. Period. <laughs> uh, but in ter- in terms of how I read, I mean, I do try to to kind of keep well acquainted with the reading experience across all devices. So I do a lot of kind of the the later later at night the e reader and, and the backlit. Um, I have an Oasis, so uh, that's that's my go to there. I also try to to steal um, you know moments reading when, when I can uh, on my phone. Um, I think continuous. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the continuous scrolling feature, and and, and find that that's uh, you know an easy way to just keep the story story going. Um, and then I also tend to dabble in in the kind of comicsology world, which uh, represents an entirely entirely different level of series complexity. Um, but I like uh, Fire Tablet, some of the bigger Fire Tablets, um, and iPad. Like those are Kindle app on iPad or Comicsology app on iPad are great ways to. Um, kind of read that so that you can get the full full color full page on the screen at the same time and it's just like reading a comic book so um i tend tend to tend to dabble but but um kind of re- read when and where i can these days yeah well now does your worldwide series lead uh, include uh comicsology and in, in comics uh, so it, it includes Comixology uh, as one of our kind of principal partners. There's some some nuances to the comic experience and how they how books are published with regard to. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the comic comic world, but generally things will get published as a 30 page issue, like one of your more traditional uh, what what people think of when they think of comic books. Then after a period of four to six months, those get generally bound into what you'll hear referred to as a, a trade or a, a volume, and then uh, they get again rebound into a collection of, of volumes that, that might end up being like a 400, 500 page omnibus. So hmm. this, the content is um, both uh, like you can read the issues, you can read the volumes, you can read the omnibus and you get kind of the same content, maybe at different rates or at different price points. Um, but that, that presents some really uh, interesting challenges. And so one of the, the uh, we, do, we do do a lot of work with Comixology to make sure that they, uh, like their expertise is really in the comics comics piece and some of the connectivity there. So they, they act as a, a data provider of sorts to make sure that we've got all the most accurate information uh-huh. about um, some of these, you know, more interesting edge cases where, Iron Man and, and Captain America and, and Spider Man are all kind of having adventures together, and then they go off and do their own, um, you know, back to their own books. And so some of those pieces are a place where, where we spend uh, or they spend a lot of time, kind of making sure that those those aspects are right. Um, and we're happy to help uh, help their expertise reach reach our customers. Huh. Interesting. Anything else we haven't talked about that uh, you want to mention? I think we we covered a, a great deal. That I think the one thing that I would mention is that you know we uh, are continuously trying to make series uh, better every every day than the, than it was the day before. You know, there's a ton of series books out there, and, and while we've got, I think most of them, we we were. I'd be lying if I told you we've got everything everything 100 percent perfect. So we are, uh, you know, we'll continue each day, not just. Uh, launching new features, but but getting uh, higher levels of coverage and higher levels of of accuracy um, in all all the series experiences. So, uh, we hope customers are really excited um, about the new features, both in library and, and outside. But um, are are kind of excited to to continue to uh, launch uh, amazing features, amazing series features for customers. That's great. I have been speaking with Patrick Woolahan. Principal Product Manager and Worldwide Series Lead at Amazon. Thanks very much, Patrick. Thanks, Len. That's it for this week. My guest next week will be my grandson, James, who turns 15 this month. He was on the show about a year ago. Uh, His experience as a brilliant high school freshman at a new school in the midst of a pandemic will, I'm sure, be enlightening. I can't wait to talk to him. Uh, We are in our third rental of our stay here in Sanibel this winter, and we've landed on a golf course called the Dunes. So I have started to take some steps toward wondering if I can resume playing golf. Uh, I I had a period when I had a corporate job where I did play a lot of golf. I loved it. We belonged to a country club, Paradise Valley and Casper. Darlene played a little with me, too. I realized that uh, that was just about the time Amazon was being founded, 26, 27 years ago was the last time that I held a club in my hand. But I I hit a bucket of balls, and uh, some of them had that old feeling of how it's a fun game when 
you slow down and it's smooth. And I'm trying to get a lesson with the golf pro Mike coming up and see if I can't uh, do a round on this course. It's a very intimidating but beautiful course because it has more water on it than it does grass, literally. It's just built around a series of lagoons and lakes and the this thin ribbon of grass <laughs> that weaves through the water. Uh, very intimidating for someone whose uh, uh, golf shots are going to be very unpredictable, at least uh, uh, in the beginning of my return to the game, if that's what happens. So if you have any tips on uh, what to think about as you address the ball. I know there are some golfers out there. Uh, please send them along to me at podchronicles at gmail.com. And thanks for listening. Hope you have a good day. Bye. Bye.